the amount of equipment we will send to the, to the amount of equipment that they have. Let's just say they have a, a, a CF industry explosion, a terror explosion again in the, on their side. Let's say something horrible happens. So we could tax all of our resources. What do you have on right now? How many ambulances? Right now we've got three on duty. Uh, and we're... And more, so you're going to be we, sending we, them and calling in people from overtime. No, not necessarily. Basically, well, if we have the resources available, because if they have an immediate need like that, they, they need uh, staff right away. So no, we'd, I know. Be, we'd be triaging however many we could potentially send without decreasing our ability to... But in cover. one of those major ones, we're sending... We're going to be calling people in. It happened at Terra. It happened at Flight 232. Potentially, yeah. It, happened, it will, and we should. But my problem is it's unfair because the most they're ever going to send is one or two or whatever they have. Because you, you have the capability of how many ambul ambulances have you? We have the capability of eight if we put all of the uh, sideline rigs on duty, but that decreases the, the fire response as well if we do that. I, yeah, I, because four of those are, uh, are in. I, I just don't like them. That they don't, you don't spell out how much equipment you're going to send. That's. It does indicate that we will send... Um, one paramedic for emergent patients for responding rings. Let me tell you what, whatever that says, it doesn't mean being... Unless there's an emergency and the director can add more staff and personnel. That's correct. So, so in the future, do, do those need revised to spell that out a little more clearly? I don't know. I just think that we, we either have to be compensated when we're doing more than what that person would have if we send more than that or something because... As far as compensation goes with these patients, uh, the normal billing would apply. So if we go over there to pick up a patient, we'd that, be, I mean, it's, that, it's not. You know, that doesn't mean you're going to collect. It doesn't mean you're no, going to get that. That's very Listen, true. in an emergency, you don't get the paperwork. You don't do any of that stuff. You, you get them to the hospital, which is what you, we're not, you're not going to worry about that kind of stuff. But it, I mean, I, that it bothers me and I'm not picking on South Sioux. They just happen to be here today. But you know, if you have a major fire in one of these other communities, you know, Terra was not inside the city limits. No. But we sent all kinds of fire personnel down there to respond because of a 2080 agreement with the county or with Sergeant Bluff. And had we lost a fireman in that thing, it would have been all ours. And, and I don't know how you'd make it fair, but it's not fair the way the system is set up today. Go ahead and state your name and address if you want to speak. My name is Clint Merrith. I'm the fire chief for South Sioux City. This particular 28E agreement, the EMS agreement, was really uh, to assist Sioux City as well with the new EMS program that they have, and they're trying to staff everything. We have three ambulances in, in South Sioux. We're able to staff two fairly quickly, and we can call back for a third. South Sioux received a, a license nearly two years ago to come into Iowa to transport patients around. And this was a thought to help out as the programs are developing on both sides. Uh, South Sioux received a grant in 2016 to add five more personnel on. So I have three staffed all the time with the availability to call back. Uh, we do have a 20E instant aid agreement with uh, Sioux City. With the newer equipment that we have, we're able to send crews over to assist on this side. And it's reciprocal if we need. Uh, myself, if I'm not there, one of my officers are there, and they require additional services, we go into a mutual aid assignment, which comes out of our local volunteer fire departments. If they cannot answer the alarm quickly, then a call will come over to your law enforcement center, your dispatch center here, and request appropriate equipment. If we need a truck with three or four people, or a fire truck, and then again, if we need ambulances, we haven't had to request any services from any other allied agencies from either state since we um, put uh, five people on February of last year. We are able to sustain all of our calls. Uh, last year we had over 1,300 calls, which is 42% above what we had two years ago. So we're maintaining what we have. This is more of an alliance to help both sides, something that either side has never had in the history of either city. So this isn't anything that we're going after to ask Anytime we have something big, we don't think we can handle that. We're going to request your services. We're here to help you as well. We may be small, but we I, can still I, do. I understand that, but 
I'm, uh, 20 year agreements are not in the, when you're the largest area, when you're the largest city, I'm not picking on South Sioux, you're probably more capable of handling things than other communities, but they're not, they have a lot more potential for <laughs> liability for the largest community in the area than they do for the smallest, if that's my point. Because there's no competition. If, if you had a fire today in at IBP and you needed our big ladder truck or our big snorkel truck, right? Because you couldn't handle it. And we somehow, because it's a cold day, the guy fireman falls down and injures himself. Under a 28A agreement, we assume that liability. It's not on South Sioux, it's on Sioux City. So with that, that's my problem with these 28A agreements. Understood, and it'll be the same if we send our firemen over to help as well with our ladder truck. Well, but this is this particular one is is for EMS, is I'm, for emergency I'm, medical. I service. understand that, but I'm talking 28 agreements in general okay. in this area. Are this not particular one doesn't cost any city anything. If we come over and we assist, there is no charge to Sioux City. If we request uh, assistance over in South Sioux, um, there's no charge for I'm that. Not I'm not it's asking. just talking about hypothetical situations. Talking about liability. And hypothetical. Yeah. I'm, and and I'm I think talking it's, about it's liability. Chal it's challenging to strike a balance, I think, right? You never <laughs> want um, something, a catastrophe to happen at that scale. And <clears throat> I agree. I understand the liability is out there and compensation um, maybe is a second thought, you know, when those things are happening. I do get that. But I would also really struggle with, wow, there is a huge accident happening over in South Sioux, but we only agreed to send three ambulances because would they only have three ambulances so we have everyone else here that's able and willing to help but we're not sending any more you know what i mean i would i would struggle with that as well that would weigh on my conscience triaging a service request is kind of a struggle sometimes but we have to we have to make sure that our home base is covered first yeah. same with uh, same with them they have to make sure that their uh, primary taxpayers are, are uh, covered before exactly. before sending resources out and I, I do understand what you're saying about the hypothetical um, because it it could happen, but it could ha happen both ways. Uh, we have far more industry in Sioux City and so on that's potentially subject to disaster situations than, uh, well, with the, with the uh, except for the, the big beef processing and some of the major corporations over there. Um, so, I mean. Do we have more um, other uh, 20, 20 yeah, yeah. agreements out there? Okay, so is there a difference between that and mutual aid? With, with, I mean, EMS, the not, with EMS, I'm not certain on that. I think uh, we we're working on one with North Sioux. North Sioux wanted to do away with their transport agreement that they had and go to a 2080. And then they were also working on a 2080 with uh, Sergeant Bluff uh, to, to basically fill in as backup for us uh, in, in case and, and vice versa. So is there a difference between mutual aid and 28E agreement? Is that the same thing? It, to my knowledge, they're basically the same thing. Uh, the 28 e agreement is probably more formal agreement and signed by both uh, agencies or multiple agencies. Yeah, if and there these, is one. In these aren't uh, paramedic <coughs> assists or <coughs> responses. They're they're strictly mutual aid. So it's not like we're going over there to hop in their ambulance and help them with their patient that they're going to bill for. It's just uh, we're going over and or vice versa coming and over. And the right. same thing then, the 28E and, and the mutual aid is the same thing. The way I understand so, it, yeah. so now we, So now we have a 28E that's more, it's more of an agreement. Yes. And it, and it gives, in the case of law enforcement or I suppose, well in the case of law enforcement, it gives them the, the uh, legal authority to perform their duties in another jurisdiction, I think. So, as well with the agreements that they've had over the years. But yes, it, the whole you harmless you agreements don't have here. You twenty-eight agreements with other police departments. Well, I think we did. Well, you do through the tri-state drug task force. That's a twenty-eight e. No, I, well, we've done it in the past. I know when Sergeant Bluff hosted uh, Rag Bribe, we entered into a 2080 agreement so our officers could go down there and perform. Maybe in service. Iowa, but I don't know that you can get that across state lines. Okay, so. You've got a federal agreement, Pete. So we have mutual aid with other small communities, right? That's correct. So why, why don't we have a 2080 agreement with all these small communities then? 
do have a 20-day agreement with Marsu, I believe. But I mean like Salix, Sergeant Bluff, do with Sergeant Bluff. Amber Haggerty, Assistant City Attorney. Traditionally, our 28E agreements are with um, communities that are in other states. Once we cross that state boundary, we enter into the 28E agreement. We have one with North Sioux City for EMS, and uh, the one tonight with South Sioux City would be our second. Nebraska has a different code section. They call it differently. The Iowa Code section's 28E. That's why it's called 20. And the 20 in the 28D agreement it has to receive approval from the Secretary of State as well. And both cities have a right to terminate the agreement upon a 60-day notice as well. Correct. And the effective date for the end for this um, agreement is the end of December of 2021. There is an end date. Then you're fine. I'm assuming you've looked at this and uh, City Legal and and the whole harmless agreement you're fine with? It follows the basic format that we have to follow under state law. Um, there are certain elements that we have to include in all of the agreements, and we've followed that format. You didn't draft the agreement? Uh, this came over um, from Jim, and we reviewed the agreement. It was patterned after, after, I believe, the other agreement that we have in place with North. Correct. Okay. Okay. I think that's it, right? Thank you. Passes 4 0 to 1, and I vote no. And it's not anything against Sausu. I just don't like these agreements that don't specifically call out the equipment and those sort of things. So, 14 is a resolution approving a subordination agreement with Heritage Bank for the 48 South residential project at 4800 Southern Hills Drive, deferred from January 7, 2019. I'll make a motion to defer it until January 28, 2019. Second. Passes 5015's resolution approving amendment number one to the consulting services agreement with HR Green for the Bridgeport West Improvement Project deferred from December 10th, 2018. And I think this was deferred because it was a flat fee and now it's a why was it deferred? I can't remember. Staff missed the deadline. Oh, is that what it was? That's a different one then. Okay, because I, I thought we'd right. approve that one. Isn't that what was in the RCA about why it was? Yes, it was. Uh, Gordon Fair, uh, city engineer, that was deferred uh, at your request, right? Because he was uh, that they were under law lawsuit. We were settling with them or, or in negotiations with them. Who? The subserpco. With, with uh, regarding this project and the reason for the overage. From HR Green. All oh, additional inspection and for additional and inspection for being on, on the project for additional time that went into the evenings. Yes. To make sure the work was done. But why did we defer it? Why would that have any bearing on? That's not why. Well, I don't think some decisions were made, Gord. I don't think some decisions were made by the contractor or subcontractor. I'm guessing the sub. Well, the subcontractor had the sad work, and that's the reason they had yeah, to redo it had to multiple work. times. They're the ones that that are charging for the additional service. No, I know that, but I don't know why did. why we deferred it. That's what I don't understand. But okay, whatever. We have a motion. I'll move it. Second. Almost made it to 4.30, Matt. 
No, I'm not. Chris Larkins, Larson Park Riverfront Development Project. Matt Salvatore, Parks and Recreation Director, uh, Smith Group is here again, our landscape architect. Uh, we've been working with them for several years on the Riverfront Development Project. Uh, they were here last March and presented our final schematic design uh, that was approved by the City Council. Since then, we've been working with them uh, into our uh, final design. Uh, we're about 35% into that. Uh, this is kind of the final design development. and. Uh, you will see some refined concepts today based on what you was presented in March, some tweaks. It's basically the same project with a lot of refinements. Uh, the next steps for the steering Riverfront Steering Committee is to refine our phasing and start our campaign. Um, so with that, I will kick it over to Tom Rogers, and he's going to work uh, talk through the entire project with you. Matt, Tom, before you start, Matt, did you mention, I'm sorry, I was looking at something else here. Did you mention that there are members from the... Parks. Yeah, there is. There are several members of the Park Board and Riverfront Steering Committee here in attendance, and we can have a discussion at the end of the presentation. Any questions you may have? Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, once again, my name is Tom Rogers. I'm a landscape architect with Smith Group. I'm also here with Andy Lumen, who is our project manager with Smith Group, and Greg Roth, who is a civil engineer with Beast Trend Kemp. And what I'd like to do is just go through the overall approach. Um, what we've been through, I'll do a quick recap of where we started in the master plan and how we got from here to there. Um, talk a little bit about concept and goals, and then really we're just going to take a walk through the park uh, to go through from one end to the other where we're at with our improvements now. And then we'll talk a little bit about budget phasing and next steps. Um, since a little after March, we've been working on our design development, as Matt mentioned. Um, in the beginning, when we started, we did a master plan for the project to really identify what the goals and the program for the park should be. Last year, in March, I was here and we presented the schematic design as we refined those goals and really made them into something. So this year, we've spent refining those, those original designs and really detailing out what everything will look like. So what you will see is what that looks like. We would move forward with our next step, documenting certain pieces that we would implement for construction. Um, I just want to show one slide as a reminder of context of what we're looking at now. And, you know, we've been working on this for a couple of years now, and I went back through some of the earlier slides, and it made me realize, you know, what a transformational opportunity this is. Being so close to the downtown, to have this much land on the river to change in this way from an underutilized parking lot to a, a city park is really a, an important project. And we want to make sure that we're doing that right. And I just want to walk through the approach we've taken to make sure that we're doing this the right way. So we've had, we've had quite a bit of public input. Um, this will be the sixth public presentation we've made from our initial sh charrette, um, where we gathered input, had public input session, and then several council presentations as well. Now I'll talk briefly through, just very quickly, the overall design of the project and how we got to the concept we have. So Highway 29 is being reconstructed. You've all been living with that for a while now. Um, but one of the advantages of that is you're adding different or different and larger connection points to the river. Two of those um, are very significant at Virginia and at Floyd. So we really designed around really looking at those two points and understanding that the center of that uh, would be the most important piece of the park. That is a civic gathering area that we identified as one of our early goals. We wanted a large civic space. And we felt that those two focal points at the end of each of those drives um, were nodes on either side of that. So this really becomes the focal point for a park. In order to create that, uh, we needed to make sure that we had enough space for this. So we had a, a number of talks about Chris Larson Park Road and how that fit into the context of the park and wanting to make sure that we had enough space for this civic area that we were trying to build as the center of the park. We also had conversations about traffic speeds on Chris Larson Park Road, how that was used and how that should relate to a space along the river in the future. And what we decided through that process in the master plan, and then we confirmed it in the schematic design, was that we would split Chris Larson Park Road and have a parking lot at either end, the west end and the east end, um, and create ample room to turn around. In addition, we would create circulation through the park that would double up with a bike path that would enable us to get large vehicles through, whether a semi for a large event or a fire truck or an emergency vehicle or police um, for safety measures, or if there is something staging for events, you can get uh, park maintenance equipment or other loading through there. I also want to step back to the one or the three big things that we identified in our initial information gathering, that the idea of creating a community space, this center civic focal point. 
But in addition to that, making sure that we have everyday places for someone to come down on lunch on a Tuesday, after work on a Wednesday, or swing by on a, on a Saturday with their kids, and just to have lots of opportunities for different people to use this space. And lastly, to make sure that we are embracing the river and taking the opportunities that we have to connect to it. In addition to that, one of the key items that we honed in on was creating a, an iconic feature. When we went through the master plan, we identified a Ferris wheel as a potential iconic feature. The, the reasons we started with that were it was, a, it was a large thing. We wanted to draw people in off the highway, create something that was diverse and dynamic for them to come to again and again. When we presented the schematic design, um, if you remember, we brought two additional concepts and said as part of design development, we would work with the steering committee on finalizing what that approach would be. So tonight I'll present our concept for an interactive fountain um, that does some of these same things. It meets these goals of creating a, a beacon, an icon that draws you in from the highway, but also giving you an interactive experience with a water feature and a splash play area that's something dynamic and different every time you come back and something that works throughout the year. And in addition, is authentic to Sioux City and tells a story of Sioux City. So this is the master plan of the park um, as it stands today. It looks very similar to the schematic design that, that you saw in March. Um, and it's been just slowly evolving and being refined into what we have today. Um, kind of moving from west to east, starting with our entry drive. Um, we have a, can you see, yes. Um, our stockyard garden, which we started with off of Floyd, but we've moved over here. Um, really taking that form of the stockyard and, and, and kind of an ironic um, inspiration, using it as a flower garden, a place to stop and rest. We have our two focal points at Virginia, what we call the Virginia Overlook, um, and the Floyd Plaza. In between that is what we call the Great Lawn, flanked by two places, one the promenade along the river and what we call Exploration Ridge along the backside. That is a ridge that we've brought up to partially buffer the highway, both from a noise and a visual standpoint to make the park feel more of the river. As we move farther to the east, moving into an active green space, basketball courts in a dog park, and then a passive green space farther to the east. Now what we'll do is just kind of walk through, oops, we're gonna walk through from the west side to the east side, so we're gonna walk down river, and we'll just show you the spaces as they are today. Um, so we start again at this west edge, um, walking along the side of Chris Larson Park Road, looking down this green space, um, coming to a shade structure, that's used for a day use picnic area, kind of looking through that green space. A little bit farther down is an existing overlook that was part of the infrastructure left over from the Argosy. One of the things we tried to do was where this was there to reuse it in, in the form and fashion that we could. So we would take the railing off of it, redo the railing to match everything so it looks like it's connected to the rest of the de design of the park, and then um, repurpose some of the seating, make it a comfortable place to be. Um, but it's really the what's there now. So if you walk down there now, it's, it's what you would see. I think I asked this at the Parks and Rec meeting, and I understand it's an <laughs> existing structure, but there's no way to make that accessible, right? There's not without building an, a, an extensive ramp because it is a, a significant amount of stairs. Right. So what we did is I'll show you on the, uh, on the Virginia Plaza, we did do that with an accessible ramp. Um, Chris Larson Park, that next step, um, so that idea of taking that patterning um, both the horizontal patterning of, of breaking up the squares to the vertical patterning of the poles um, that you see represented with lights here. Um, just down river from that is what we've kind of started to call the yoga lawn, which is really a flexible green space adjacent to the shelter, um, sized in a manner that could be used for small events. Um, one of those could be a Saturday morning yoga class. And then that brings us to our first node, which is um, the Virginia Plaza. So this is just off of um, the drive, it aligns with the drive that comes in from Virginia. Um, the frontage road goes here, and this is where Chris Larson Park Road is today. So we've created a turnaround here. Um, we've created a larger area where either a fire truck or someone with a boat who happened to be down here who shouldn't be down here has an opportunity to turn around, but we've created bollards around it so you can't get into the park. There would be removable bollards so you could get a fire engine or an um, emergency vehicle through there. Um, that can also double as parking for food trucks are parking for vendors in an event. There's a small shelter building here with a restroom in it and a plaza that overlooks the water. And then here's that terrace that I was mentioning at Virginia. And I'll show you how you make your way down to there in a moment. The other thing that moves through here is the bike path, which I will go through in a little bit more detail in a moment. And then there is a stage that flanks the western edge 
of the, the Great Lawn. And that could be used for seating on a regular day. It could also be used as a, as a concert um, stage as well. Someone could, we, we worked with the park staff on the trailer that they have to make sure that they could back that in there or, or someone else could back something in there as well. There's, can you go back one more? Yep. There's only the ability to walk on the Virginia access underneath there, right? A vehicle doesn't come in. Am correct. I that correct. And the way, so the Virginia access is a signalized intersection, um, but because of some vehicle stacking requirements, DOT was not in favor of opening that up to Chris Larson Park Drive. However, we have designed this area, so if at some point in the future that is, there might be a possibility of pursuing a, a, a right out from there, um, or, or maybe a one way out, it would allow that to happen. So we, we, we're mindful of that being a possibility in the future, but it's not showing up in the design right now because in our conversations with the DOT, that wasn't something that they were in favor of at this moment. I just think of people exiting you know, I mean, that's going to be a major exit right there where people get off and they're like, oh, I want to go check this out. Mm -hmm. Never mind, i got to figure out how to get there. But when they do exit here, they will be able to drive up and turn in on Floyd. Floyd. So they will see here, they'll be able to look at the park. And actually, I can show you that. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. So they will actually, they'll come to this point here, and they will drive to this point here, and then they could turn in. So that actually all will be... Back pretty accessible again. for them. So I didn't catch that before. Park. There is that frontage road. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the reasons why we had extensive conversations about Chris Larson Park Road, because the highway plus the frontage road plus that road is a lot of roads in this pretty narrow area, not a lot of green. No, that's fine. I mean, I think then you just direct them. Mm -hmm. Hey, you can go park this way or whatever you want. Yes. Yes. So this, the, that, that lot at, at <laughs> Floyd is actually larger than the other one for that reason. We, we saw that as the more accessible location um, because of that. So well, I'm just going to go two different points, basically. Yep, exactly. So I'll go back a couple slides. So this is the view walking up for, from Virginia um, at the at your focal point or at your view at the end of that is the shelter, and then you could look upriver or downriver. Um, to the right is that plaza we talked about with the food trucks. To the left would be your event lawn. This shows the view um, from the river looking at the plaza. So this is about where the the ramp down to the Argosy boat was. It's, it exists today, and you can see this space here actually becomes a ramp that works its way up to the promenade, and we've stepped down about three feet off of that. So I showed you the view of the Great Lawn. This shows, I'm going to walk you down the promenade on the river side, and then Exploration Ridge on the north side, and then we'll talk a little bit about Floyd Plaza. One of the things to notice about the promenade is we've actually set it back a little bit farther off the edge of the ridge than it is today. Um, it's set back, we, we basically took the edge of the ridge and we offset it 10 feet, and then we planted that. So there's a little bit of a buffer from the end of this path to the ridge. This is also a 20 foot wide paved area. Um, it's designed to be constructed for emergency vehicles or semi to access it, but we've broken up the patterning and paving of it so that you can see the different colors. It's really just a different texture and pattern on the concrete. Um, on the right would be for the bike lanes, and on the left would be for pedestrians. It could also be signed that way as well, and it could be imprinted so you, you see that circulation. And that makes it feel, it, it organizes traffic, number one. It also breaks up the space so it doesn't feel like a highway, but it gives lots of room to maneuver around the space. Then off on, on the side of that, there's a series of steps that are built into a small, um, a small mound that buffers you a little bit from the Great Lawn behind, lets you sit on the river and kind of have a spot to hang out there. Um, but doesn't totally screen you. They're only three or four feet high, so if you were standing up, an adult was standing up, you could see past them. You could see on the other side. So if we go to the other side, um, this idea of exploration ridge. We have a, a ridge that we've started at either end at Floyd and Virginia, and it starts at grade, and then it builds up to about 15 feet above grade in the middle. This is still lower than the highway. You'll still be able to see over it, um, but with some planting on it, it provides some buffer to make it feel a little bit more part of the river than part of the highway. So we're, we were very mindful about that. Um, in addition to that, we consolidated our play areas and put one larger play structure or playground in the middle. It's not really a play structure, which you can see here. This is built into the hillside. Um, it's, a, it's a series of soft surface play environment with slides and with a couple climbing structures. These poles actually have, would have nets on them so you could climb up the, um, up the slope. Um, these are events that are just built into the ground. And then this is, a, this is the larger kids area. This is aimed at five to 12 year old kids. Um, this smaller Todd area is aimed at two to five year old kids. And it's accessible through this route over here. The five to 12 year old area is accessible through this route over here. Then we move to the east end of the park, to the Floyd Pavilion. 
This is the larger of the two pavilions. We, we did that because this is the more accessible route from a vehicle. We saw this as being the easier place to drop things off, to host large events. Um, in this area, we have, we have a drop off. You drive over and then you can park here. Um, the pavilion is here. There's men's and women's restrooms. There's also storage. And then there's mechanical rooms for the fountain and splash play area that you see here. Um, there are covered seating areas as well as a larger patio area. And there's kind of a smaller version of that stage area I talked about on the other side, which would function for a small event if you were sitting under the, the covered seating area, or you could turn it around and function, make it work for a larger event too. So there's lots of flexibility with this space. That's one of the key things that we wanted to design in. Um, there's also an overlook that looks down the river, and then our focal, um, our iconic fountain and river lights monument, which you can see in this view. So this is looking from the green, looking down river into Floyd Pavilion. So the road and the entrance is over here and the river is over here. This is the first of about six or so structures that we have. It's about 30 feet tall. Um, it's a lit up structure that we can change the colors of over time. And I'll show you some images of that. And then we've actually shown some patterning. This is just kind of a generic pattern, but I'll go through what the patterning looks like. Um, this shows another view as you drive up. And what you see in the background is kind of a mist or kind of a fog. Um, that's the fountain. Um, we did extensive work uh, with a fountain consultant working on how this thing would work, how it would fit together, uh, making sure that we were getting really good use out of it, making sure it was interactive and fun and playful, but not using too much water and not making maintenance too much of a burden. So this is a series of sprays um, that can be operated either on a timer or on a motion sensor. So when you walk up to it, they come on, and then the fog does the same thing. The lights would be programmable by the park staff, and they, they could be changed over different times of the year. So how, how many um, walls do you think you'll have? Um, how many walls? So the, these, are the, these are the features right here. So there's six or seven of them all together. The tallest one is here. It's about 30 feet tall. And what we wanted to do is make sure that it was something that you could walk in and around instead of just in through, really, instead of just around. So you get a, a different experience, a unique experience, by, by being able to go in different parts of this. So, so can the, the lights, I'm sure, are going to be different colors? Yes. Yes, so actually I'll show you a little bit more about the lights. These are designed as larger um, lit up structures that would be sandwiched by um, stainless steel panels. That stainless steel panel would have a perforated pattern in it and behind it would be set um, a series of lights. So when you walk by these, <coughs> you, <laughs> you kind of get the sparkle that you would get off the river. If you think about how the light reflects off the river you would get that, that look and character. So one of the things we wanted to do was how do we take that idea of the light and the ambiance and the feeling of the river and bring it up into a structure? Um, and how do we start to layer these things all together in a way that really represents Sioux City? So part of this perforated panel is actually a design. Um, it's a custom design that would be indicative of the community. This is an example of a river, but this could be a history panel. It could be architecture of downtown. It could be a timeline. They could be different on different uh, since we have seven of them to work with. It would not be the whole thing, it would just be the part that's close to where you view, so the rest of it would be a standard perforated panel that these lights would be behind. And then we can change this color, whether it's for time of year, if you want to have an event at Christmas, or whether it's for time of night, uh, when you want to come back later or see it move or see, see something happen. So it, it gives a dynamic experience that you can see again and again, and kind of gives you a reason to come back and look at it. But then if you go there during the day and the lights aren't on, it's still interesting to look at. And there's something that you can see from close up and really appreciate it when you're right next to it and touching it. But also driving by, that, that light of that beacon will, will draw you in from the highway. So what power is the lights? They're LED lights. They are not solar powered, if that's what you're asking. And so are they on all night long, every night? No, they would be on a timer and they would go off at a certain point. So we could determine what the use is and it, do they go till 10 or do they go at a later time or do they dim at some point? I mean, there's, I think there would be lots of flexibility within the system to control that and see if you wanted it, you know, on, a, on New Year's, do they stay on till after midnight and there's a celebration there or on a regular summer night, are they going off earlier? There, there could be some flexibility in that. This is what that could look like in the night, and this shows you some of the different colors and how the fountain is lit up as well. Oops. And this just shows you another view from over the top and shows you how we layered in a series of stone on the base to really kind of play up that idea of the sedimentation and the buildup and the, the shoreline of the river, but also 
to give kids something to climb on, to give parents a place to sit, and to be able to be on the edges of this thing to make it a little bit more interesting. So moving east of that is um, our last shelter, our, our restroom shelter, uh, an exercise node with basketball courts, a dog park with a small dog and large dog park, and then we have a shade structure and just kind of a passive picnic area. Um, this is that first view. This is an active green, flexible green space that could be a, a place to toss a frisbee on a regular day. It could be programmed by the park staff for bag toss or bocce or anything like that. You can see the restroom in the background. Um, you can see the basketball just past that. And you can kind of see the dog park, the dog park fence in the foreground of this image. This is a larger view of the dog park. As I mentioned, it's split into two different areas with side, kind of a side-by-side -side entry, but they're two different entries. And this is a view looking back across the park. Um, so that shows that shade structure, and then you can see looking really upriver. And this shows the, that core area we talked about. Really just a minor question, but the way you said it, I just want to clarify. We'll oh, sure. Back to the dog park. Is it, <clears throat> did you say side-by-side -side entry is what you're kind of thinking? Mm -hmm. So we bring you to a core area, which is here, and we've provided two di different entries that you could get in at this point. Because I'm just thinking, like, and I... Matt knows this, I don't know dog parks, right? Like, I don't know the best idea, but it's like the whole point is kind of separate those animals, you know, mm -hmm. different energy levels or habits, what have you, I don't know. They would but, be required to be on a leash in this area. Correct, but I wonder, what I'm getting at is, gosh, you're bringing them right next to each other to get in there. Would it be better to have two entrances that are 20 feet away from each other? So it's like, well, I'm not bringing my Bernard next to your Chihuahua, but if you have them right next to each other, it's like, well, guess what? they're meeting right at the entrance or right when we're ready to go. It's just a thought. You just said it that way, and I was like, you know, it could be challenging <clears throat> if you're trying to separate the spaces. And again, I reiterate, I'm not an expert. It's just a thought. So you bring up a really good point, and one thing we do to put them together is to kind of consolidate services, whether it's a signboard yeah. or whether it's a water fountain or anything like that. But yeah. what you could do is put that thing in the middle and kind of have the entrances a little farther apart. So they're, they're in the same area, but they're not, they're not door here and door here. They're door with... 10 feet and then a door. So we're consolidating them generally, but they're not, you're not opening the gate, you know, the two gates brushing up against each other with the dogs. That's what I You got a little more, more space than that. So that's probably, you know, if you look across the basketball court, that's, that's 40 or 50 feet across. That's probably a 20, 25 foot area where these two entrances happen. Say that again? What? It's probably a 20, 25 foot span from, um, from here to here, so there's an entrance here and an entrance here. So those, those gates could be 15 feet apart, so they don't have to be you know, right side by side. I just want to at least be thinking about that. If that's Definitely, it's a great point. Um, and I'll go through, we went through that, we went through our view back, and then this shows the overview <coughs> of um, that central green area, so Floyd is to your right, Virginia is to your left, and this shows what it could look like at night in an event. Then we'll talk a little bit about budget, and I'm also going to talk about Perry Creek a little bit, because one of the things we were asked to look at uh, was, was Perry Creek and improving fishing access along the riverfront, so I want to make sure we cover that. Um, so we have refined our overall plans. Um, we're at a full build-out cost right now, or full build-out budget. This includes construction costs. This also includes um, consultant fees, permitting, all of those things, um, and contingency at $16.4 million. This includes everything that's shown in every drawing. Um, we understand that this project will get built in phases. We understand that there's certain money the city has allocated right now. And so what we've done is we've, from the beginning, we've broken this into base costs that the city is looking at funding and additional costs which we would look at raising other money for, whether through grants or through private um, funding. So those base costs are the mo mobilization and demolition, <coughs> earthwork, uh, putting in the plantings that you see, water and storm sewer ser services, the streets and parking and paving and your general circulation, your trail, your key sidewalks, and then I should say your pedestrian lighting and electrical. That budget is about five, five and a half, five point six million. So of that, um, the city has about six million dollars that are available for funding. So we've been looking at how we strategically phase this project to um, build some of the basic improvements, but also find opportunity um, to raise money through, through grant funding or other sources. So what we're looking at now is fiscal year 2020, there's $2 million available and then a $1 million a year every year after that. Um, so we're looking at a first phase that really starts at the east end and works west. Um, and what that does is it builds the Great Lawn, 
Um, it, it builds some of this circulation area, but it generally leaves some grass areas. Um, that, and it does some of the, the bigger mobilization and not mobilization, um, demolition that we have to do. It, it carries on a lot of those costs. Phase two builds Exploration Ridge, and then it builds the second parking lot in some of those core areas. We've, we've said phase three is $3 million. That's what's available now. That's construction could start in the spring of 2020, complete in the fall of 2020. Um, phase two, we've allocated a million dollars. That is the city's money, and we're, we're taking a, an estimate that the city can raise a million dollars, whether through um, its variety of funding sources. And then taking, and that would be 21, 2021 to 2021, spring to fall. And then taking a pause where in 2023 we would build that phase three. And that, that could be more, and these could be structured slightly different depending on how fundraising goes. So we're kind of taking a, what's the, what's the best, most practical, pragmatic approach for this? How do we get the basic infrastructure in and how do we put this together in a way that we can leverage um, other investments and make this a, a really great space over time? So lastly, I just want to touch on Perry Creek. And I will point out that <laughs> this estimate does include improvements that we have proposed at Perry Creek. So it's does not, or doesn't? It, it does improve the Perry Creek improvements. So we looked at, in the initial design, we looked at fishing on Chris Larson Park at Floyd River. And we looked at building a structure out over the Floyd River. So we found out a couple things. One, there were some current concerns from the DNR and the Corps of Engineers about flooding and flood levels and, and water in that area. It also wasn't the best fishing. And we decided that it was, it, there was one third thing is that it wasn't very accessible. And we decided that because it was so far from parking, we didn't want to extend the road in. Um, it wasn't as good a fishing as it could have been or the best spot on the river. And it was, it was kind of an expensive piece of infrastructure. We, we took that part out of our concept. And so when we, we presented the schematic design, we were asked to look at Perry Creek. So we spent some time meeting with the Corps of Engineers, meeting with the DNR, um, we bringing several concepts to um, our steering committee. Some of those concepts had um, floating docks, some of them had piers, some of them had overhangs. Um, there was some, we found out a couple things. One, the best fishing in the area is right here, kind of midway up Perry Creek. That's where people tend to go to fish. Um, two, there's actually some energy dissipators that are in this area. So the Corps was really reluctant to have us build something and get people really close to there. But well, so what we did is we created an accessible route to this place and we created a fishing platform in this area and I'll show you that. Um, so we started with this design of actually we went through the dock scenarios of actually cantilevering it out and trying to get better access to the water. Um, the Corps had some concerns about how this wall works um, structurally both from how it was built and that it could handle this load that it was put on it and also from a scour standpoint of, of flood levels coming up and getting behind this. Because we are at a, a flood elevation where this will go underwater in a flood event. This did go underwater in the last flood and it, it, we would expect it to go underwater again. So we pulled that back to the level. We put an accessible, accessible rail in um, and really created the same experience. You're just not hanging out over the water. And we'll show that this way as well. So there is an accessible route. We've built this sidewalk or proposed this sidewalk down from the parking lot provided a couple lawn terraces and a variety of seating, and then created this accessible fishing platform um, within Perry Creek, or with, on the edge of Perry Creek. So really what we're doing is promoting that as an accessible fishing location along the riverfront. You're a long ways from, you're above the water quite a ways. You are above the water a little ways, yeah. Depending on the water elevation. And remind me, Matt, are we saying just go down to the other fish cleaning station, right? We're not putting anyone there. Yeah, we didn't see you to duplicate fishing stations, but, you know, basically you're, you're way on the back out to the park. You just hit oh, that, yeah, the, you'd, hit that cl you'd have to pass right by that fish cleaning station. Bucket or whatever. Yep. Um, and then the other question I had, that last slide, the, I don't know, show the schematic, more, 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 that one. It does show the renovated bridge that's still the plan, right? Because my thing was just trying to get the bike path not crossing the street multiple times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's the current bridge. Uh, that project hasn't isn't further enough along yet. But if a if a bridge does get renovated there, we want to take the trail, I guess, along with it, so that you don't have to worry about crossing Chris Larson Park Road twice the way you do now. So that's not planned right now. It's that's not just, a part of this project. Called. Right, that's what we're gonna um, hopefully continue to work with engineering on that.
you show that doc thing to the River City Anglers? Kelly had the conversations with the with the fishing community, so I, I don't know if he reached out to them or not. Do we have some comments? No, I believe that they are the same how Gaston said that for the wall you got there. Every individual. You got to come to the mic and state your name and address. That's not a liability, but my name is Christian Bowder. I came for a different issue, but that's fine. That wall is ridiculous, and I think you picked up what I'm throwing down. If you were catching onto a fish, there's catfish for dinner, main fish you'd be fishing for there, or your carp is pretty common in that area. Yeah, there's, there's no, no sense ridiculous. even building that. Right, it's ridiculous. Well, that's the you only place that I that we have swimming, and you're like, yeah, 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 and then no, oh, I'm just gonna watch it swim around for a while. You ain't gonna pull up a fish on the wall. That's the only place that we've ever seen people actually fishing at the period. But they're not, they're going right to the edge of the water. They're not. Yeah. What they're down. saying is once it breaches the water, it's not going to stay on the line. I've seen and some I, very large fish in five gallon buckets right in that same location. Yeah, but they're yeah, fishing but they're right fishing from, from the, the bank. They're fishing from no, the I've landing. seen them from that location specifically. Then they walk down the wall and then they pull the fish from the boat. They're not bringing it up on the wall. Mm -hmm. That's not happening. How far down could you reach a net? I mean, you're not going all the way down to the water. The problem, once you talk about problems with actually getting out into the channel or into the Missouri. Well, there's, there's some, well, getting into the channel, just the amount of current that we have, plus the fact that we're on the outside of the bend makes it very difficult to build a pier that's there. If you think about the, um, there was a barge there that actually protected the Argosy when it was there, and the amount of debris that would stack up there. So you'd have to build a really heavy piece of infrastructure to be out on the bend. Um, we talked to the Corps about you know, building something within that, and they were pretty opposed to building a structure that was down on that level um, with some of what they have that's in there and also f some of the flood rise considerations that are there. But it's going to flood anyway. Why can't you just put like a sidewalk for people to fish off of? I mean, why don't you back, back up to that slide? Because they're going to fish. Oops. Hang on. No, I, did, I, I mean, you could, you mean you could take that sidewalk down farther? You could take that same concept and go all the way down. You, could, the, you could extend the, the sidewalk farther. And take it all the way down to the the river itself, where the Perry Creek and the Missouri meet. We do run into some challenges with the actual run of the sidewalk and the slope that's there and making sure that we're keeping it accessible because it's, it's not a very steep slope that we can have to maintain an accessible route. But you could extend that sidewalk farther down so that, as, as this gentleman said, that you could walk your fish down closer to the bank. Well, whatever. I, I mean, you need to talk to people that actually fish and I fish out of a boat, I don't think you're gonna, I, I agree, if you're, they're fishing for catfish and carp, they're not fishing for walleye at that point, which you would use a net with, but I guess you could use it for the others, but I haven't seen anybody, but you, you gotta get down, you can't, well, anyway. I, and you said you can't bring it lower because of the flood concerns, that was the yeah, Keep it out into the river. Actually, I'll, I'll bring up something. If well, that's fine. I'm saying if you keep it level or you keep it yeah. even with the river, not the little. When you originally talked, property. you were going to put it down here where it says Perry Creek. Yep, that, and that's where that's where we started, and that's that's where we found out a couple things. One was that people were fishing up here, not down here. Um, two was trying to put when something. You, when, how did you determine that? That was we spoke, with, we spoke with people that were fish, that were fishing there, and they're pulling them up in that wall. I've never seen anybody fishing other than over by the wall. But Kelly's had more of the conversations than I have. Okay, let it go then. And we, but we can, we can certainly refine. No, I, I'm not going to argue about fishing anymore. It should have been more down at the other end, but that's okay. But if you leave it even with, and so there's not that outcropping, like if you just bring it down, so you would be closer to the water for it, is the only concern of the flooding? No, the other concern as we start to go lower um, is that there's a significant amount of. Um, movement that this area has because the water does come up in this area and if you look at the pattern of this um, if you, you see how this kind of bumps out here so this is not a static condition this is a, dy a dynamic condition that has evolved over time if you look at when this was built it actually was built and this was open more like this where this wasn't here so that's that's built up over time with sediment that happened from the flood but it's happened from other annual events as well so that moves around a little bit some of the concern is building that infrastructure, building that walk in a way that's not going to wash out and get destroyed um, by some of these flooding events and making it accessible. So it starts to become this little 
um, complicated piece of infrastructure to build. It's always, which is always a dynamic when you're on the water's edge. So Matt, how high is the platform oh, above the creek? Sorry, and the core had concerns about building those improvements as well. 12 feet, yeah, do you know 12 feet, the 12 to 15 feet. Guarantee it's gonna be at least on days, it's gonna be, nobody's dragging a catfish up there. 12, 15 feet from there? Oh yeah. 12 to 15, I don't think it's quite, quite that far. Shoot that catfish. <laughs> <laughs> it's not more than, I would say it's, it's, not, it's not 15, it's less than that. Yeah, well, depending water on levels what are the flow in the is, high 70s. It depends on the flow. It does depend on the flow. And you're at a high water mark right now. I mean, the Corps has been releasing excess water since last summer, but mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Let it go. Let's move on. Go ahead. Instead of making a fishing dock, why don't you make an observation dock deck where you kind of have like a little, kind of like a dam type thing, but not a dam where it don't hold the water back and they're going to impede the water flow. Mm -hmm. Stock it with huge catfish where, and you could have like little, where people feed it, you could have some geese there, people feed the geese, mm -hmm. the observation thing. Mm -hmm. Or won't let you that, do that. That would make a lot more sense than a yeah. fishing platform. Yep. <laughs> okay, what else you got? So that, that is all, that, that is the, the entire park, kind of the summary of the whole park. So um, if you have other questions, I can yeah, go back. I, I've got a big question. You were gonna try to attract hundreds of people and you got 67 stalls. Mm -hmm. Where are people gonna park? Are we still gonna park at, are we still gonna park in the auditorium parking lot and walk across there? Because if you are, that's a long ways away to the activity area. Sure. So we, we actually talked quite a bit about that um, at the master plan stage and schematic design stage. And what we set upon was establishing an amount of parking that we felt would work for day use. And for larger events, we would have parking that was adjacent across the street here and then in some of the, the adjacent lot that's across the highway over here. But and where? We don't own land there. Where, so where is it going to be? And who's going to... That's not in your $16.4 million budget, guys. So... I mean, this is all great, but if you don't have parking, don't build the park because people are not going to walk miles to go to this. And do we still have, can we still get under? I'm not convinced we can. Are we still going to be able to get under the interstate? They've got the bridges there, but they're not going to allow traffic, so we'll still be able to get under at Nebraska Street. Mm -hmm. but, we're, but if you park, where are you going to park in Virginia Street? I mean, the case, the Hardy's guy's not going to want you parking in his lot going here. Honestly, and, and, the, and the people that have the right of first refusal, like Lechner Lumber on that lot, can exercise that with the DOT unless you can make a lease with them your, on Virginia. Your best bet is probably the Tyson Longline parking lot, which is a little bit away. Um, but similar to like Saturday in the Park, I mean, if you're going to have a large event and that great lawn, you're probably shuttling people to that space just like what they do for Saturday in the park. <coughs> and then I thought was hopefully get overflow parking, but that's, that's something that has to be. Right. Well, one of, the, one of the things we also recognized was that if we parked it for 500 people, we'd have what we have today, which is a 500 car lot. Um, so there's a, couple, there's a couple options that are here. Um, we talked about walking in, we talked about shuttling in. We've also designed, you know, the way Chris Larson Park works, we've designed some parking that is head-in parking here. That's something that you could provide special event parking or, or a, an expansion of that in some way if you wanted to accommodate more vehicles. But there, there is a little bit of an option there with some of that. We've set on the numbers, we set on a number of about 70 to 80 cars. We're at... Uh, 67. You're yeah, 67. 67 right now. And actually, I think that parking that says 40 on the right is actually 45. I, I will check that. I think that's a typo. Would you be able that where it says parking 40, would you be able to push that north and make another row? Um, I and don't. Just, if, it, if there's a lot of slope, you just put a retaining wall and make another row? I don't believe so because we, are, we would be on DOT's property then. They do have a fence that's there that's about where... The dog, park, the dog park fence is actually DOT's fence. So this fence, it's not oh. built right now, but it would continue about right here. So I don't, I don't think we'd be able to fit a whole nother row in. You know, my guess too is, you know, people are gonna be walking, they're gonna be riding. Uh, it's not just uh, parking. 
So hopefully. Well, here, here's the problem, Rhonda. What do you have to have, Alex? You should know this. How many parking stalls for handicapped people in a, as, a, as compared to the total parking? Like four for 10 or something? Four for I mean, 10 or one for 10, yeah. So you're only going to have about seven or eight, nine, ten handicapped parking stalls here. If you have a major event, you're going to need all 67 of them for handicapped people. So then what do old guys like Pete and I do? Handicap. <laughs> and we don't have the sticker in the car. That's the problem. Well, let's get you one. <laughs> On the parking 18, could you run that line of cars all the way west? Yeah, that's what I was saying. Is you, you oh, might be able to expand. expand that area. Yeah, you might be able to expand that parking. I hope it's not a might. I hope we would plan that we would. Um, and then probably towards Exploration Ridge. There's no way to go that way. And obviously you could direct people. I agree if you can get more parking on the other side of the interstate or you can park at the expo and run on the trail or something. That's like another good point. You know what I mean? Is like you could just direct people, hey, we're having a trail event. You park at the expo or park somewhere there and you hop on the trail there or even gosh you <clears throat> park down by Chautauqua and ride up or something and, and we do want to promote alternative mobility and transportation with this so recognizing that some people will want to use that to bike here or to walk here from a little bit farther away so we, we feel know, also if you're going to have an event down there you can all, there's always shuttle mm -hmm. shuttle from Tyson mm -hmm. and it, it really is a balance of what are we designing for are we designing for people to use the space or are we designing for the big event? And, and we've done this actually on a lot of projects where we get into this parking struggle because you're, you're trying to accommodate so many things and what you wind up doing is creating a, a, sometimes what can be a vacant space a lot of the days of the year. So we've been- That's true, but I, I would think on a Saturday you'd want more than 134 people parking down there. If you take 67 times two, that's what you'll average if you're lucky in Sioux City. That's 134 people. That's a lot of area for 134 people. Now, granted, some will park over by the Anderson Dance Pavilion. Some may park over to the arena, but you will cause conflicts with that when they have a big event. And you say park in the arena parking lot? That's not going to work. Because it's not going to work, because we've seen that at the Tyson Event Center and the Long Lines. When mm -hmm. you try to have an event and it doesn't, it conflicts with what's going on in the diet. I, I, I'm not trying to <coughs> be on your parade today, but 67 stalls is not very much parking. And if you start in, in it, it, let's be realistic. Right now, let's go claim the lot by uh, Floyd Boulevard that's next to, across the street from Mid-America. Let's claim that today from DOT, not let them resell that and put it in your budget because you're gonna need that for any kind of an event. And let's not start with something that's 16.4 million, knowing it's going to be 20 million easily when we get done. I think we ought to be transparent about it and say we're going to tr we're going to try to get work with the DOT and get that Lechner lot back before the Larry Book. I think is probably the right guy before he claims that because there's a lot of parking you could have happen there with a the trail across. But let's put it in the budget so we know that because I don't see. Unless you guys know more than, but you want people to use it. People, the, the one thing will drive people not using it is make them walk three yeah. miles to get to it. Because not all of us want to go down there just to walk around. I realize that that's what you're trying to get is active participation. I understand that. But maybe I just want to go down and look at your fountain. I'm not walking from the Tyson Event Center over. I'm not going to do it. We also have a parking lot going up too with Hard Rock, so that would be another option. But Just you're going to park there to go down to Floyd Boulevard and yeah. look at those fountains? I'm not. And, and nobody my age is going to, Rhonda. So you, you've made this a 20 to uh, under 40-year-old park. Matt, is there any opportunity to use some of the green space you have down there now and make it parking? Yeah, we can work with Smith Group on making those. If we, you know, to get more parking without having to shuttle in and... Well, actually... Or maybe not. Maybe I don't know. There's an opportunity to increase the parking count that we have today. However, there will be a limit to how much we can increase that parking count without sacrificing some of the, the events that you have in the park. So there's a balance between that. the two. And so I think the, the big thing that we need to land on is what a target number is. Um, and the target number that we set was between 70 and 80 before. And I apologize. I, I do believe that we, that 
parking is 45, not 40. Um, but, but that being said, that's, you know, that's a handful of spaces. Um, if you feel that it needs to be substantially more park than it is, then we have to ad address that in the overall You plan. know what, we've got to be careful too because my whole thing is I don't want to look like a parking lot. Exactly, exactly. No, so this is a park. This mm -hmm. is a great, yeah, this, this is a great plan that you've done. <clears throat> and Tom, I want to compliment you because you've been extremely flexible on public input. We have had a lot of public meetings. I get that. We're going to probably have some more, but you've been very flexible. The problem, Pete, I have, it, it's a narrow space. It's long and narrow, and we could sit up here and say we want 200 parking spaces, but you're going to sacrifice, as you said, the green yeah. space. And that's not what I'm this, saying, though, Dan. I'm well, I know saying you're not. You're put looking, it across know, the street because that's what you're that. going to end up doing. <laughs> and, and, and I put it in the budget now so we know it. I appreciate let's be, that, let's Mayor. Let's be transparent about what we're doing here because you're going to need it. I, I appreciate it. And I, that's the way I took what you were saying. But what I'm saying is don't – I don't think – I think we want to look at what the options the mayor is talking about and right. not right now look at – can we – because we could increase parking park. anytime we want, but you're going to sacrifice so much. And the other good thing about this plan – is it offers a little something for everyone in the community and for those that visit our community. I mean, at first I was gonna say you've taken a blank canvas, but it's not a blank canvas and painted a beautiful park on it because the canvas you showed earlier had all that sea of cement, a little bit of stuff in there, sea of parking, and you worked around that, and yes, there's gonna be some demolition cost, but it's still, it, it, it's really, I mean, we should all be excited about this, and I, and I know the mayor is, and we all are, so don't get us wrong. We want it to be the best we, we can make it, but this is just a great plan that you've presented. Uh, Dan, so I, I couldn't, I, I, couldn't dis I, I wouldn't disagree a bit. I think it's a, a tremendous plan, and, and I hope it works out that way. Yeah. Uh, parking being a legitimate concern to get people down there on a daily basis, and I suspect... Um, that you may be right that 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 70 to 75 ballpark people that might use it on a nice summer day weekday where there aren't big events happening but if you do plan on making it not don't even have to have a big event but on weekends when people aren't working and the weather's good i can see a couple hundred people down there on any given day having a great time so i just throw the idea out uh, to see if there is any green space available. I, I look at the dog park. Is the dog park, park too large? I don't know. Can we, I don't know the, the sizes, but can we squeeze them in because it would tie in rather nicely to the turnaround? I, I don't know. Or can we go back down, as Alex suggested, to the, uh, to the west from the Virginia Street and, and, and park where you have the 18? It's just uh, the concept is is terrific. I have no anxiety about it at all. I and, and I hope the community gets behind it. And there are people who can step forward and 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 help with uh, contributions. Uh, it's just you don't want to get so much in there that there's no room for people to get down there. Well, you're going to have people parking on that road, whether you like it or not. That's sure. what happens when you have a wedding at the Anderson Dance Pavilion of any sure. size now. They park on the park road. And you, and you just are going to come to grips with that. If that's acceptable, if you've made that wide enough so that they can still get in and out, then that probably works. But it's they're going to park there. You might be better off to make sure that that's the case, that that road's another three or four feet wide so that on you know people coming and going. But they're going to park on that. They do now if you go down there on a major event day. So. When the River Bowl was down there, they parked everywhere. <laughs> I know. That's yeah. what I'm saying. So it's going to happen. Sure. We'll pursue that area to the north before we add a lot more parking within the park itself. You, you know, here's the deal. This is our jewel. This, this riverfront is, is going to be the jewel of Sioux City when we get done. So we, we have one shot at this to do it right. And, and we want to do it right. And we want the most people that, that we can get down there. And we want it in the shortest amount of, uh, you know, time that they can get there from the Tyson to wherever they're driving, you know. So, you know, we want people to enjoy it. And that's, that's what it's all about. But we got one shot at this. 
got to do it right. Art and I are the only ones in the room old enough to remember, but 30 years ago, Art, they, we had the Siasio plan, and everybody said, this is the crown jewel. This is where we're going to make things happen. This is going to be the greatest place ever. And then you elect people that don't want to do any of this stuff, so it grew weeds again, and that's what you have to be careful of. Get a realistic plan, get a realistic budget, and begin to do it in pieces so it's, you don't eat the whole elephant at once, try to have this community eat the whole elephant at once. But I just hope that we're serious about getting the plan going. Because we were here 30 years ago, ask Mr. Art, he'll tell you. Were we not Art? And, and nothing happened. So we've got to be careful that we don't build this thing to the point where people get turned off and get real negative about it right away and you've got to convince people you can do it over phases but you have to have a commitment out of this community that something will happen or it's a nice plan that you've charged us a lot of money for like Dave Siasio that'll sit on a shelf for 30 more years and nothing will get done which bothers me because I think it's a great plan I just think you I mean if you want people to go there and you want people to use it you've got to have more than 80 or 80 stalls that's my personal opinion and I hope I'm wrong but I hope I'm right because that means people are using it a lot more than what you're anticipating. So we, we might. I'm not going to disagree with you right now, but you know we might find ourselves then. What's our priority for what aspects right. of the park are we looking for? And I don't look forward to doing that because I think. Then it becomes personal to me. I might say, well, I just like something really serene where I can just sit and sleep for a couple of hours. But <clears throat> I, I think we just want to be careful. I like the Ferris wheel. Just everybody laughed, but you know what? That Ferris wheel will cost you a lot more than his uh, spray fountains will cost you. I can tell you that. So. <laughs> Saying, I like the lights. I think those are going to be a yes. a big deal. And it's going to be a lot more lighting than what a Ferris wheel would be. So I, I'm, I'm totally on board with that. All right, citizen, can, uh, anyone, citizens want to be heard? Chris. On the park. On the park. On the park. Oh, on about the park? Yes. They probably get a lot of parking spots on those basketball courts. <laughs> <laughs> so didn't you say citizens concerns, Bob? Yeah, so no, for, for this park. About this. For this park. Oh, okay. Art, come on up and state your name and address. Good afternoon, Art Silva, Deerfield Drive, Sioux City. Just a question. I'm looking at the Great Lawn. Will that be lit at night, or that could be like Central Park at night? It's, it could be a safety issue. Uh, we have designed uh, some large floodlights into it so we can light it up. Okay, I, I just a question. I don't know what the specs call, but I think you should have some kind of lighting and security <coughs> down there at night for people that might want to use it. Thank you. Thanks. Great plan. Thank you. Floodlight issues before when we did the bridge where it interfered with neighbors across the river. Wouldn't floodlights interfere with the people driving down the interstate? Should be careful with that. You can shield those because t with the new lighting, you can put a ballpark right next to interstates now, which you couldn't used to do. And then it's the way that the way they can you can do that. I mean, yes, yes. The lights would be designed as full cutoff lights, which means there's not light escaping out to the side. They're right. they're that, very directed. Yeah. I like how Bob's looking in the future about the parking and stuff like that. I see all these trails, intricate trails, and I see all these trees and this nice grass, different shapes of grass. And what is the cost to maintain this a year? You know, has anybody, have you guys Yeah, they've that? got a budget for that, yeah, and they're, they're, they're that building it. There. I'm sorry, this is my first. Yeah, first no, they're building it. They're Two building meetings. it so it's a whole lot of low maintenance flower type stuff. And to keep the sidewalks off the snow and all that stuff. And I don't know, it looks like a big deal. That's first, I've never really been involved. I'm really out of my element here. I'm a virgin. To Chris, you're doing just fine. So most of, most of us are too on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Any other citizens that want to be heard? All right. I Thank really, you. yeah, I really appreciate your making the report, <laughs> Matt. Thank you for, for all that the steering committee's done, Parks and Rec. I mean, it's just, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm with Ron on this. I mean, it's just, we want to do it right. We, we're going to have to be flexible. I hope we can be as flexible as you have been with the changes we've made along the way and that we continue to make. So it's just a, 
it's just an outstanding plan. It's, it's, it it's offers so much to everyone. It may not be a lot to everyone, but there's something. There's at least something available, some activity that's available for each and every citizen we have in this. Are, are there more public meetings planned? As we keep moving uh, along our, our various phases of design, we'll, we'll keep doing more, at least public presentations okay. to let everyone know where we're at yep. in the process. Because I think that will help too, to find out exactly what people are interested in. So the next step would be to lock down on what our next phase is gonna be and, and uh, do a design contract accordingly. Thanks. Well, we have that meet coupled with the CIP hearing that we'll be having that we're starting on Saturday as well because that'll be in the capital improvement program. Yes, it is. The numbers that we used were from the capital yes. improvement plan. The master, <clears throat> a masterpiece in process, so. God, I've heard this before. Well, thank you all for your time. <laughs> we're here, we're gonna make it happen. Uh, thank you all for I said the day I left and they, they couldn't wait to get. But guess what, you're not leaving. Those plans. Well, we're gonna make this happen so you don't have to be bothered to come back again. Yeah. <laughs> All right, citizen concerns. Now you can come now up and Chris, tell come on up. <laughs> you don't really have anything against basketball courts, so do you? I'd rather, I'm kidding. I'd rather be able to park. <laughs> you know, if I'm going to a twenty I'm million dollar to... park. I'd like to be able to park. You know? I'm not much younger than you guys. Um, my name's Christian Bowder. Um, you said name my address too. Twenty eight twenty seven South Lemon. This camera really makes me look about fifty pounds bigger, but. Um, would you, in our like, society, would you like her always, to point it to somebody else? <laughs> well, I noticed I have neck fat when I was sitting there, and I've never seen that, see, on that. We've never seen that before. Um, <laughs> so I kind of like don't feel so good about myself. Um, in our society, we always wait till after someone passes before we recognize them. And uh, the person I'm here, I would like the city to recognize and do a little, I don't know what you want to call it. But he's been a, he's one of the greatest role models that for business owners and non-business owners. He's done more for all forms of sports, for, from boys to girls, to college, to youth, to professional, from t-ball, baseball, football, soccer, softball, you name it, he has helped. No questions asked. He's involved with charities, boys club, Morningside College. This guy, he's the last person that would want recognition, but he's the most deserving person to deserve it, I guess talking about but go ahead. you will know who I'm talking about you know I what I'm talking about yeah. already there's a road that leads from Pulaski Park and it's called Little League Boulevard there's one address on that thing I want to make a motion request whatever you call it here to rename that Bob Rowe Boulevard it leads right to his restaurant there and nobody in the history of CCD will ever do more for this town in the name of sports or charitable contributions I mean, there's other wealthier people that get their name on things or whatever. And the, the family doesn't know I'm here. Nobody knows I'm here. I'm here just because it's the right thing to do. Um, Chris, I, we've, we've been talking about this for quite a while. Yes. And I talked to uh, Mr. Padmore, and we came up with an idea. Would you like to? Go ahead. Okay, so instead of, what we, what we could do is put his name underneath the uh, Pulaski Park. Would you say it was Pulaski? Pulaski. Pulaski. Yeah, yeah. Put it underneath, underneath that, so there wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a problem. So is that an actual street? Or yeah, is it's a. I mean, but it, I just drove by Little League street? Drive. It says Little League Drive. Because I'm not sure if it's an officially named yeah, street, and if it's not, then it. I'll pay for it. No, that. No, no. I, mean, I ain't got an issue with that. Who, um, I'm sorry, I, I've been in CC a long time, but who, who is Chris Larson? He was a highway commissioner back in 1960s that actually was instrumental in getting the interstate through. Uh, that come, you haven't been around long enough to remember when there wasn't an interstate there like some of us were. Sure. And so there was not an interstate. He was on the highway commission for years and he was the guy that got the other commissioners to go for the funding to put the interstate along the riverfront. I understand. Bob Rowe Park sounds a lot better, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. there for that. Oh, well, if you um, check, if you, know check just, if you check the history, Chris Larson was sure, like, I'm just being facetious, yeah. Bob. Um, so me and we, we'll we need to what how informally it, it would what we what it would take to rename that. 
I'm guessing you've got to check the zoning. I mean, you got to check P and Z to see if it's even a dedicated street. Yeah. If not, then it would be an independent thing. Uh, I think right. it'd be, and that's the least we could do. If you guys could think of something more, this man deserves it. Um, well, we, I tell you what, we all know, we all know that for sure. Yeah. Bob Rowe is, you know, he's I mean, the icon of, of Sioux City yes. when it comes to I mean, He's a role model to any business, business owner. I wish that. I could do half as much as that man does. You yeah, know he's, I mean? a, he's a wonderful man. He's a hardworking guy. Thanks for delivering the message to us. Uh, yeah. yep. Little League Boulevard, I think I don't he know said. If public so, record, it, he okay. is, so I just he, like to get something done as soon as possible. This is a time sensitive matter, if you guys know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so uh, Mr. Padmore is in charge of that. He's, he's going to get right on it, and then I'll get back to you as soon as I find out something. Uh, okay. Hey, this is very interesting. I wish I would have sat there and zipped my lips a little bit more. I'm sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> See, this is what it's all about. We, we need to talk, and so uh, you ought to come here about every week. Thank right. you. Uh, you guys get sick of me pretty quick. <laughs> oh, we had a couple but other people. Have Jerry Moore yeah, that's right. My first tour duty, so we miss him. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. I'll be talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Makes Anyone yes. else be heard? <laughs> okay, Mr. Gretkin. Um, the only thing I have left on my list is I was just curious about the status of the uh, old YMCA building. I drove by it over the weekend, and now there's graffiti on the east side of the building along that north south alley, really bad. I don't know what the gentleman that purchased that property has in mind but and i don't know what the status is if maybe we could check with daryl and I, I know it there must be some things if nothing else we could clean the place up a little bit that between all the trees and the graffiti. I can report the graffiti my understanding is no progress has been made uh, with the person that purchased the building and made commitments uh, very few were done and now it's more or less been abandoned again. Yeah, and it just looks like it's getting worse. And then there's there's also that property in the ninth Nebraska street, on the west side of the street, those brick apartments that were there, 10, 12 of them. And I can't remember the people's names no, that, yeah. that had that, but that's just been left unattended forever as well. And uh, I'll, I'll follow up with Daryl. Thank you. They went to work and did all that and and now they've got one garbage container that sits in the public right of way, yeah. and it's big enough for about you and me <laughs> that overflows every, every stinking week. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's all I have. Um, I don't think I have much. Uh, maybe I'll remind everybody about next Monday. It's Martin Luther King celebration. 7 o'clock. 11 o'clock? 7. Oh, 7. Hey, yeah, that's the one at May. Mayflower Congregational Church. Uh, make sure we get the address correct. I think the Saturday Journal had an incorrect address for Mayflower. It's just off of 18th and... Um, 1407 West, West 18th yeah. Street. Is it Rebecca? No. 1407 West 18th Street. It's the address of the actual church. Okay, well, that's it's it fronts the other way, but okay. Okay, yeah. It's Mayflower Congregational Church. 7 o'clock. That's all I got. I signed us all up for the choir, by the way. Well, you were singing our little. I hope they gave you a solo. <laughs> he is a solo. <laughs> Are you singing in it? I'm not this year. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to, yes. But I'll be there. I'm planning to attend. And we have no meeting a week from today. Am I up? Alex left me a long list. <laughs> <laughs> no, he has to do his own list or we don't go into it. Mr. Padmore could, uh, and I'll apologize ahead of time if I've missed the report, but could get a report from one Siouxland as far as what's happening. Benicom. Yeah. You don't, you, you don't recall seeing one either, do you? Okay, good. Okay. Don't forget budget. That's this Saturday, 9 a.m. CIP hearing. Uh, What's our book? That's all I have. Where's our budget book? Should be one in your uh, in your drawer down there. Back here. That's where I picked mine up at. Oh, there they are. All right, I have oh. I have one a couple things. Number one, uh, I'm uh, kind of used to reading financial statements, and 
I really don't care about, I mean, I'm glad to get like Spectre's booking and Kinsess bookings and all that. Is it possible to get like a real financial statement that we could see how they're doing based upon budget? Yes. Okay, I just think that when they give those reports, that ought to be part of it so we know what the heck is going on. So, um, I don't see many bookings. Uh, I don't, I, if they're not losing money, that's another thing, but so. How can you not lose money if you don't have bookings? I don't know. Well, because sometimes when you have bookings, you lose more money. Well, <laughs> you know what, Bob? You're right. <laughs> Which for what you may not want to have. I, but that I'm I just want to I see that. actual financial statements that I can read. I second of that, Heidi. Capron? Aye. Redkin? Aye. Moore? Aye. Scott? Aye. 